today's the second Sunday of Hatur, and as you heard, this is a very um, the common uh, gospel that we read, the, the parable of the sower. Uh, if you remember, we actually read this last week as well. Um, so we read it two weeks in a row. Um, and uh, it's nice that the church focuses on things that are relevant to the people. So uh, the reason we read this two weeks in a row is that in Egypt, um, back in the day, uh, this is when you planted seeds. So you would plant seeds right around now, you'd wait four or five months, and then you'd have your crop in a, in a few months, and then you'd harvest your crop. So everyone in Egypt right now is planting seeds, or was planting seeds, and so the church adapted to this and constructed the, the readings around this, this, uh, this practice of the people. Um, and it's nice when we see the church sort of do that, because this is what Christ did. He came down to our level. Um, and he talked about things like, you know, farming and cooking and fishing, things that simple people would understand in a simple way. Um, and so here you see the church mimicking Christ and just simply adapting to where the people are at and doing what it is that's, that's on their mind, which is planting seeds. Um, and so uh, this, this parable is, is, you know, you've heard it many times and many times when we hear this parable, we think about the four different kinds of soil and we think, you know, there's thorny soil, there's good soil, there's stony soil, and then there's the path. And I always think to myself, which path, which kind of soil am I? Am I the good soil? Am I the thorny soil? And we, we focus on the soil. Um, but of course, the, the parable is called, it's not called the, <clears throat> it's not called the parable of the soil, it's called the parable of the sower. And so the church and the gospel really wants us to focus on the sower, who it is, that sows seeds um, in this way. And so the parable really isn't about the land uh, at all, but about the sower who seeds, who throws seeds in an, a you know, lavish, extravagant way. Um, you know that seed, of course, is the most expensive thing for a farmer. And so for a farmer to throw seed, um, knowing that he's throwing seed on ground that won't produce any fruit is kind of weird. Um, and it's interesting that a farmer would do such a thing. <clears throat> Sorry. And so here, clearly you see the farmer is very loving and very generous. And in this parable, of course, the farmer is God. The farmer is Christ and he is out throwing seed on all kinds of ground that we all know may not produce any fruit. And this is sort of this unconditional love of God. Um, and it's, it's hard for us to grasp sometimes about this kind of unconditional love. Um, and we think sometimes that God loves me more when I fulfill the commandments. You know, when I come to church early, when I do all the right things, you know, somehow I've appeased God and now God loves me more. But it's not like that, right? Um, God doesn't love some more than others because they do more of his commandments. Um, and so St. John Chrysostom has this great uh, quote. He says, For the sower makes no distinction in the land offered to him, but simply and indifferently casts his seed. So he himself, too, makes no distinction of rich and poor, of wise and unwise, of slothful or diligent, brave or cowardly. He plants his seeds among all, fulfilling his part. And so the parable says that when you reap, you sow these seeds, you're going to reap fruits. And it says, you know, 100-fold, 30-fold, 60-fold. Um, and the question is, what kind of fruit are you going to get? Well, quite obviously, it depends on what kind of seed you're throwing, right? If you throw orange seeds, you get oranges. If you throw peach seeds, you get peaches. Um, and you never get peaches when you throw orange seeds. It just never happens. It's never happened in the history of farming. Um, and that's obvious to everyone, isn't it? That, that we only get the seeds that we throw. And so this very simple principle is something God teaches us through creation. And it's like the creator wants to teach us about himself through the creation. And so one of these very solid tenets of earth is you get, you get what you throw. And that's what comes back to you. And it's, it's, it's that God is using the creation to teach us about himself. And we'll get back to this in a second. So what kind of seeds are being thrown? Well, the parable tells us, it says it's the word of God, in, and that's what's being, what's being thrown. And the question I have is, what, which word of God is it? Is it like the Old Testament? Is it the New Testament? 
Is it the saying of the fathers? Is it saying of Athanasius? Is it the paradise of the father? What's being thrown here? What word of God is being thrown? And so maybe the question isn't what is being thrown, but whom is being thrown? Who is the word of God? Isn't Christ the word of God? Isn't he the Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity? So maybe the sower isn't throwing verses and scriptures and spiritual meditations. Maybe he's throwing an entire person. Maybe he's throwing Christ himself. And maybe Christ is the seed, the word that's being thrown. And sometimes, you know, we, we think that it's all about reading the Bible and memorizing the Bible and that the Bible is the goal. But the Bible isn't the complete word of God. The Bible isn't um, the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so the Bible isn't the, the goal, isn't the objective just like the church is not the objective. Christ is the objective of the Bible, of the church, of the prayers, of everything we do. He's the, the final goal. So my, my goal isn't this book. My goal is him and my life with him personally. And so if the seed is Christ and I'm the earth and he's planting his seed in me, in some of us, it takes root and grows and produces fruit. And some of us, we don't bear any fruit. And the question is, what kind of fruit does it grow? And remember, we said that an orange seed will only yield oranges. And so if he's planting himself in me, then, this, then the fruit that's going to come out is him. He's growing Christ in each of us. And when we think about the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and you know, we read about them in, in Paul's epistles, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, you know the, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. When I hear those fruits, who do I think of? I think of Christ. Don't they remind me of Jesus himself? He has all of those characteristics of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So now it's, it's kind of starting to sh take shape a little bit. And this whole process reminds me of something very, very familiar. Right? Where, where Christ plants himself in us, and then what comes out is him. Right? What does this remind you of? Something we're doing today. It's the Eucharist, right? where Christ comes and we take him, and then we become him, and we produce him, and we become partakers in, of his divine image and his likeness in us. So let's kind of summarize. Christ is the one who's throwing the seeds and the seeds are him, and the fruit that comes out is him. And this is exactly what we say in the liturgy, isn't it? We offer these gifts unto you, your gifts, from what is yours. So what we're offering is his, it's him. Alexander Schmemann has a wonderful book um, uh, called The Eucharist, and it's just kind of a classic book. And I'll read you this quote. He's, he's a little hard to follow, so I'll, just, I'll read it slow. In offering our life to God, we know that we are offering Christ, for he is our life, the life of the world and the life of life. And we have nothing to bring to God except him. So when we offer ourselves to Christ, we offer him. There's a, a beautiful story about Abunam Shoy Kamer, just kind of reminded me of Abunim, the, the Abunam Shoy Kamer, the saint. He went to their city of I don't know if you've ever been up in, in Egypt, and there they have all of St. Damiana and all the virgins uh, buried in one spot. And it's right where they pray the Eucharist. I don't know if you've been there. It's like a big mound. It's really cool. Um, and Abunam Shoy Kamer, when he went there, he just had this nice spiritual meditation. And he said, I wonder if all of these um, martyrs sacrifice themselves for Christ or did Christ sacrifice himself for all these martyrs and that's, just, that's just the thought that came to his head when he saw that the martyrs were there and the Eucharist was was prayed on top of it anyway it's just, and he says for he is our life the life of the world and the life of life and we have nothing to bring to God except him we know that in this offering Christ is the offerer and the offered the receiver and the received. So, Christ, so God created these plants that comes from the seeds. And it's this really amazing concept, isn't it? The idea of seeds and plants. So if I take like a avocado seed, right? So it's this big and I put it in the ground. This thing that's this big grows to <clears throat> 10,000 times this size. You all seen the avocado tree, they're gigantic. And then this one seed produces over the lifetime of a tree 
thousands of avocados. It's really quite miraculous that one seed can produce thousands of avocados. You just put this little thing into the ground and it will replicate itself over and over and over again for decades. And he used the exact same <clears throat> concept when he talked about a little bit of leaven. <clears throat> Leaven's the whole lump. You don't have to put much leaven. <clears throat> Sorry, didn't have much water this morning. Um, you put a little bit of leaven in the lump and then it leavens the entire lump, right? You don't need much, much leaven. And so Christ is the person who's throwing the seed. He is the seed. He's the fruit. Oops. And what we see is that Christ is throwing his seed out on everyone, the good and the bad, those who deserve it and those who don't deserve it. And in the Gospel of Matthew, he says he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and reigns over the righteous and the unrighteous. So let's think about this sower for a second. What's my relationship to this sower? The sower in the story is God, it's Christ, and he's the one sowing. And what's my relationship like that? And there's a, a, a hint in the verse we just read that you may be the children of your father in heaven. So aren't I called to be in the image and likeness of God? Aren't I called to have the same characteristics as him? If he's my father and I'm his son, then I'm, aren't I supposed to act like him and talk like him and, talk, and think like him? And all, all the fathers of the church, both St. Cyril and St. Athanasius, teach us that God took our nature so that we become partakers of his nature, right? In the, in the, in the Theotokeia, we say he took what is ours and gave us what is his. So we're called to be the sower, just like the sower who threw the seeds. So I'm supposed to be this imitator of Christ. So if God sends his reign on the righteous and, on, on, and the unrighteous, then shouldn't I do the same thing? If God is throwing his love on everyone with re without regard to their worth or their dignity, shouldn't I throw the seeds of love on the ground of my fellow man, even if they aren't worth it, even if they don't deserve it, even if there's no fruit that's going to come out of it? I heard a sermon a little while back, and it's really struck, stuck with me, where there is no love, plant love, and you shall reap love. Where there is no love, plant love, and you shall reap love. And I really, that really affected me. And I see the truth of that statement all around me. I've started thinking of so many people I know who planted love in places that there was no love, and eventually they reap love from me, from others. And it grew and it came back to them. And in the epistle, St. Paul says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap spar sparing, sorry, sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will reap generously. So when we sow love generously and sparingly, we reap. And so the question I want to end uh, the homily with today is what kinds of seed are we planting in our fellow man? Do we plant seeds of love? And if so, what do those look like? St. Isaac the Syrian has this beautiful quote. He says, conquer men by your gentle kindness. Conquer men by your gentle kindness and make zealous men wonder at your goodness. Put the lover of justice to shame by your compassion and mercy and with the afflicted be afflicted in mind. And so when I think of the seed that I throw to my fellow man more so than anything else, it's my words. My words are the seeds. And they're the main thing that we throw at each other all the time. And there are all kinds of words out there. Words of encouragement, words of affirmation, words of strength, words of love, words of forgiveness. But then there's other kinds of words. Words that crush, words that disable, words that hurt, words that bite, words that undermine, words that slander. And so whatever your words are, whether they be uplifting or crushing, hurtful or healing, you plant and you get back what you plant. If you plant words of hatred and anger and resentment, that's what comes back. And it comes back a thousandfold. Remember, if I plant figs, I get figs. And so this is the exact point that St. James made in his epistle. And I want to read it to you. It's a little long, but it's from the, the epistle and... It's important. 
because he talks about the tongue and our words. And in this day and age, I think of all the words that are out there, whether it be on Instagram or TikTok or social media or just face to face. And there are so many words that hurt so many people and destroy so many lives. He says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. And every time I think of like massive problems in churches and in online chat rooms, it's a small spark and it just starts a fire. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by men, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. And so when I think about these words, who am I saying these words at? Well, the primary person I, if I'm a husband, my primary words are at my wife and my wife, my primary words are my husband and at my kids and maybe at my coworkers. But it turns out you're responsible for every single person you see everyone you meet, every time you meet them, whether it be in the supermarket or at work or at school or wherever you are, everyone you meet, your words are the seeds that we're throwing. Mother Teresa has this small quote that's just beautiful. She says, spread love wherever you go. Let no one ever come to you without leaving happier. Think about that. Let no one ever come to you without leaving happier. I think about your words and where they take people who you interact with. I'll read you a quote from Father Bertrand. He says, and this is something we all fall to, unfortunately. He says, there are people who display exuberant good fellowship toward outsiders, but show anything but love and affection for their own. So some of us are like this, right? We're very nice to strangers, right? To people at church, to our, you know, distant friends, but at home, we're really not nice. We're not nice to our family. We're not nice to our kids. We're not nice to our spouse. And then there are others, different group, who restrict their love to their families and a small circle of friends, but are cold to anybody outside the circle. And so there's some others of you that are like this, where your family, your friends, they're number one, you talk to them, but everybody else, you give them the cold shoulder, all right? And you're not very friendly with other people. And then this is the part that hurts. He says, it has been well said that a man loves Christ as much as he loves the person he loves least. I'll say that again. A man loves Christ as much as he loves the person he loves least. Ouch. The person an individual loves least is the person he is least willing to assess, assist. It can be further said that if there is any person on earth who is excluded from your love, one does not love Christ at all. Harsh, but so true. And so the well, final question is, why is it that we throw seeds of love on ground that we know won't yield fruit? So in this parable, 75% of the land didn't yield fruit. And in your lives, 75% of the people you know won't yield fruit. So why do we still throw love at these people? Why did Christ give this parable and very clearly tell us that I am God and I throw love on everybody, even though I know 75% won't yield fruit? And why would I give my encouragement and my love and my favor to people who don't deserve it? Or for someone who won't change? You all know people who never change, right? And there are people in my heart whose life is like stone. There are people in my heart who are just a trodden path. And there are people in my heart who have thorns that just, there's just no hope. So why did Jesus do this himself? And the answer comes from a homily from St. John Chrysostom. And I'll read it to you and that will end us. 
St. John Chrysostom says, he speaks this parable as if to anoint his disciples and to teach him that they are not to give up, even though those lost are more than those who receive the word. So even as an apostle, even as a Sunday school teacher, even as a servant, you know you don't ever give up. By why, but why would it be reasonable to sow among thorns or rocks or a pathway? With regard to the earthly concept of seeds in the earth, it cannot sound very reasonable. And here's the important part. But in the case of human souls, it is praiseworthy and greatly to be honored. For the farmer might be laughed at for doing this, since it's impossible for a rock to bear fruit. It is not likely the path will become anything but a path and the thorns anything but thorns. But with respect to the human soul, this is not so predictable. For there is such a thing as the rock changing and becoming a rich land. Here it is possible that the, the path might no longer be trampled upon or lie open to all who pass by, but that it may become a fertile field. In the case of the soul, the thorns may be destroyed and the seed enjoy full security. For had it been impossible, the sower would not have sown from the Gospel of Matthew. So what he's basically saying is people change. People who are thorns, people who are rock, people who are whatever, they can become rich soil. So he's telling us to throw love no matter where we go, no matter whom we find, no matter whom we see, whether or not they deserve it, whether or not the sun shines or doesn't, because those people change. Maybe not this year, maybe not this decade, but eventually. There's a beautiful saying, someone was speaking to us about. He says, he who loves the longest wins. He who loves the longest wins. And this, this deals with all interactions with all kinds of people. Every once in a while, we like to think that the sinners are out there. The sinners don't come to church. They're not in here. And if you're a sinner, you shouldn't be here. But that's not what Christ did. He who loves the longest wins. I'll, re I'll end with a, a poem from St. Francis of Assisi. It's a prayer for peace. He says, Lord, <clears throat> make me a channel of your peace that where there is hatred, I may bring love. Where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness. Where there is discord, I may bring harmony. Where there is error, I may bring truth. Where there is doubt, I may bring faith. Where there is despair, I might bring hope. Where there are shadows, I may bring light. Where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is the forgetting self that one finds. It is by forgetting that one is forgiven, and it is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Blessed are